Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. And now we are recording. Ladies and gentlemen, all of my beautiful, wonderful listeners of Weird Web Radio, it is my incredible honor to tell you this is episode one. Hundred and bringing back to the show Paige Zafariu from the very first episode. Paige, welcome back to Weird Web Radio. It has literally been a while. <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie. It's so good to be back. Thanks for having me again <laughs> for all these years. <laughs> I know it's been it's been quite a journey, like we were talking about before we were recording. Mm -hmm. Um if people go back and listen to episode one, the very first episode, um, you will notice that I really did want, I had my heart set on having Paige on the show. Because back then you were doing a show in tandem with somebody else. And I forget the name of it now, but you only yeah. had a couple episodes that came out and I loved the vibe of it all. And you always had the most incredible answers and everything. And I thought, this will be the perfect start right here. <laughs> oh. And I was right. <laughs> it's it's nice to say that I was right. I mean, here we are at episode 100. It has mm -hmm. we're in the eighth season of the show. Um, thousands of listeners. So it all started with you, Paige. I can't oh. thank you enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy, Lonnie, with where everything's gone. It's just amazing to see. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And and you and I had kind of cooked up this plan a little bit for quite a while now. But like, mm -hmm. how how would you feel about coming back for episode 100? I would have had you back sooner, but <laughs> it just like I guess it's maybe the unfortunate part that you were episode one, and I had this idea in my head: you have to be episode 100. <laughs> 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 um for anyone that doesn't know Paige, first of all please go back and listen to episode one and get to know where Paige was then and if you are familiar with Paige, uh where Paige is now uh according to your website uh page is a fair you.com it is a dot com yes yes, yes. it is dot com uh page the fair you is a sacred artist spiritual guide and trained water colorist living and working in Salem, Massachusetts on land known to the indigenous people as, do you say that tribal name very often? Cause I think I'll kill it. And that don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I believe it's Nome Kiag. Uh, it means fishing place, which is what this town of now Salem uh, was called. Well, that tracks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, when I went to Salem um, the years ago, I did not know it was a harbor town. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, with a rich pirate history even. So Yeah, we have two pirate museums across the street from each other competing. It's <laughs> it's paradise. I love it. No, oh, that's very cool. No, I dig it. <laughs> um let's see, what else did you have here? Paige specializes in helping Leaders, entrepreneurs, and passion-led people to navigate the path of their soul's true callings for the benefit of all. And then on your about page, you have this incredible story about places you've been, things you've done, people you've trained with. Uh, shout out to our boy, Chiron Armand. Yeah. Kai, I miss you, dude. We haven't talked in a while. Hit me up, please. <laughs> uh, stop your Beautiful world traveling. Things. I think he's a spy now. <laughs> oh, yeah, secret agent yeah they've got that secret, secret agent, agent vibe. i love it that's right <laughs> <laughs> um so i guess since it's been a really long time and i have really changed the way i do this over the years i'm just gonna start where i kind of like to start now mm -hmm. um page i guess in the last several years now have you experienced a haunting or any kind of paranormal phenomenon? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> so, uh, 
I think about how to answer that because <laughs> the, the answer is yes, but it's a little bit of an unfair answer maybe because for the last several years, I have primarily been working as a medium as well as card reader and watercolorist. Gotcha. Um, so I've been experiencing the kind of hauntings that people bring to me. Yeah. And I've been focused yeah. on a lot of uh, <laughs> resolution work. Uh, so right. I've been encountering a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, spirits who uh, are kind of ready to no longer be haunting, but be more of a, a guiding presence, if you know what I mean. Um, oh, yeah. Which has been enormously rewarding and is some of my favorite work to do. Uh, in terms of the more traditional haunting, though, paranormal experience, let me think. Um, so, yes, there's this beach in Salem, not too far from where I live, that um, has the most intense presence, especially around Halloween, of just like this crowd of the dead coming in with the tide. And oh, uh, wow. Yeah. I have a friend who lived in a house on that beach, just right there on the beach overlooking the sand. And, you know, I'd spent Halloweens there. We'd spend holidays there. It was a very active house uh, for living people. And <laughs> every once in a while, you'd get this, like, crowd of the dead essentially crashing the party, um, mm. just rolling in with the tide, uh, coming right through the house and... I remember there was one friend who kind of did this sleepwalking thing with her phone where she like kept trying to show my friend her, her phone and had typed this message in it that didn't make sense and um, described this dream she'd had where she was being led through the house, but it was like a fairy mound where there were all these people eating and drinking and it, she couldn't find her way around. Things kept getting turned around. It was this very fey kind of dream this very otherworldly, you know, other side of the veil kind of dream. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty typical of these, of the nights when the dead would roll in like that. Uh, yeah. It wasn't every party, but it was usually around the times when the veil was thinner, you know, around Halloween, around the solstice, when, when we usually gathered anyway, I suppose, which mm -hmm. probably didn't help. <laughs> uh, w when you experience something like that, you know, you talk about the dead rolling in and things mm -hmm. of that nature. And you said you've been working a lot as a medium. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you experience it? Like, uh, do yeah. you see and hear them the way you see and hear me now? Or is it a feeling or a knowing? Like, yeah. break that experience down to its actual elements. Yeah, so I'll definitely say I don't necessarily see and hear them the way I see and hear you now. Mm -hmm. It's not like a vivid hallucination in that sense, not necessarily really clearly visual, uh, clearly auditory. I do kind of hear or know things in my head when talking with, especially typically it's in mediumship. When, that's when someone's ready to be resolved. There's more of a talking, you know, kind of exchange there. Often they will show me, I'll ask them to show me what it is that you need, you know, that you need right now. Show me where you're stuck. And they literally will show me a scene as if a movie kind of unfolding. Um, not like, not HD per se movie, more like a smoky animated, like 1920s kind of shadow puppet play almost. <laughs> <laughs> but but that that is kind of more clear with, like I said, the the folks who are ready to to move on and kind of resolve themselves. Um, but when the dead rolls in on the tide, uh, visually, this is something that I've tried painting in the past oh, uh, to cool. try and translate it. And I'm working on a little bit of a memoir about uh, what Chiron, what Theoclotos, I think he goes by now, uh, would call my shaman sickness, and uh, which very much involved the dead rolling in, the local dead rolling in. And it's this sort of, did you ever see uh, Spirited Away? Spirited Away. No, it's an animated. So. Uh, it's a Japanese animated film by Hayao Miyazaki that ha is about the spirit world, and uh, there are some spirits in it who are almost like filled in outlines of people, sort of like this this gray kind of crowd, um, no real specific details, just sort of this. I wouldn't say misty, but very much a, a, a just a sort of presence, almost like an outline of a presence, and that's typically been. I would say that's across the board been what I've experienced when you'd say it's more of a typical haunting. Okay. Wow. <laughs> oh, very cool. 
<laughs> oh, you're good. It is the season all the time oh, for oh. drainage and whatnot from the sinuses, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> um. What's it like living in Salem, Massachusetts? Because I get into this sometimes little special episodes I call road spirits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been to Salem and it's an interesting town. And I imagine you have your fair amount of tourism and things like that. But something that has that just sitting on a land of such crazy history, Mm -hmm. like as a medium, we'll start there. Just walking around town, how do you keep yourself sane and safe as yeah. a practitioner of the spirit? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a big one. So a couple <laughs> of things I do to keep, uh, to keep sane in it all. Because it is, it is a lot. And it definitely helps me that I was born and raised in New England and here in Massachusetts. And um, so I'm familiar with the sort of blood-soaked colonial nature of this land. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but here in Salem there's such this concentrated feeling sometimes. Um, And it'll sometimes hit you unexpectedly. You'll be going to do laundry in this basement and you'll just get this, as you go underground, you'll just get hit with this sense of like, oh, violence has been done here. (laughs) Like this ground is literally soaked in blood. Like, oh my God. Uh, So (laughs) the way to keep saying, uh, one is I rely so strongly on some of the foundational practices that one of my teachers, Brianna Saucy, calls North Star Rites where you kind of have these really basic, simple, you know, shielding type practices, shielding, grounding, centering, and anchoring that you do on a regular basis for kind of hygienic purposes that, mm. that mean that when I'm walking around town, I don't have to think about it as much because I've been doing that, you know, daily when I'm in my happy place, when I'm at home with my altar, doing my thing uh, by the water and, you know, at home. So that's, that's a huge huge core part of it is if if you don't have a regular practice of spiritual like protection health and hygiene i would imagine that being skinless here spiritually you know skinless uh, would be a lot would be I intense it would be very uh, intense even just the history aside the fact that there are so many practicing you know there's practitioners in town <laughs> is just you walk down essex street and you're being bombarded on all sides by by you know, the energy of coming out of the practitioner shops and, and everything. And um, one of the other core things that helps me stay sane is to maintain a really uh, regular and close relationship to the land itself, Mm -hmm. uh, to make offerings to the land, to spend time with the land in of Salem with to be, you know, there's various places that I like to go and hot kind of hot spots, you know, maybe that feel like you're really connecting with the city. Um, with the land there and that that's like the keystone maybe because you can do all your stuff you know and and Mm -hmm. and protect yourself but if you don't have a good relationship with the place you are existing in you know you're much more vulnerable and also you're having not as good a time frankly i think (laughs) i think people are really missing out if they're not in communion with their land with the land that they live on Mm -hmm. Uh, i agree yeah yeah, everywhere you are. Yeah, mm-hmm. the land under your feet is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. And the practice goes deep, trust me. Oh, yeah. Um, so people visiting Salem, like what's what's a must do for our pagan occult leaning crowd? Where should they go? Ooh, there are, honestly, I would mm-hmm. I would say to walk around. I'm a big fan of freebies, things that are free. Um, hey all right (laughs) right start with the free stuff i would walk around the neighborhood called the chestnut um chestnut street like mcintyre district a a it's like the most concentrated little like historic colonial houses uh in town it has the ropes mansion garden which is just gorgeous also has the benefit of being a filming location for hocus pocus Uh, So there will be a lot of tourists around it just to be prepared. (laughs) It's also next door to the witch house, the other tourist hotspot for your, all your photo opportunities. Uh, But just walking around that neighborhood down the little side streets, it's just so beautiful and so peaceful. Actually, there's not a lot of people walk down those side streets. They hit the ropes mansion, they hit the witch house, but they don't necessarily know there's this whole beautiful neighborhood down there. Uh, There are also a couple historic, I think museum houses down that way. So that's my number one, uh, up there with walking out to the lighthouse, if you can, 
um, on Derby Wharf. Then you're completely surrounded by the water. It's this teeny tiny little lighthouse at the end. Uh, <laughs> it's only going to be a 15 minute walk. You know, uh, it's it's really really nice if it, if the weather is cooperating and you want to get out on the water. Uh, and that has the benefit of being at Pickering Wharf area, which has the House of Seven Gables. And again, wandering around the Commons neighborhood, just looking at it. It's so, I don't know, it feels feels nice. It's a good neighborhood to walk around. And there's lots of stuff to see, lots of little places to pop into. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Uh, I would also recommend the Hawthorne Hotel. Uh, it has the best restaurant in town, I think. That's where I take my out-of-town people. It's a restaurant yeah. in Hawthorne. And uh, I have never stayed there myself, but I have a local witch friend who has stayed. It's famously haunted. Um, she has stayed and, and experienced some paranormal activity. So if that's your thing, I hear the third floor is uh, where to go. <laughs> third floor, Hawthorne <laughs> Hotel. There you go. <laughs> I, I hope there's more hotels there than when I visited. Oh, there's I definitely. Out. They're doing I very well. out in, uh, what year was that that we went? 2000 seven or eight somewhere mm-hmm. in there maybe six seven eight somewhere in that range and i remember when we got into salem because we drove i don't ever want to do that again i'm gonna fly into boston <laughs> rent a car next time yeah. um <laughs> we pulled in it couldn't have been better though we pulled in it was a full moon that night there was a like a light misty fog on the ground oh yeah salem all the half the city's lights are off you know <laughs> like it was just cool and we found out, at least in that year and that time, we weren't allowed to check into a hotel after like 11 p.m. What? And it was like one in the morning. We're like, so we had to go over to Danvers. Oh, yeah. To get a hotel and came back. Uh, and at that time, there really was just a few Airbnbs, the Hawthorne Hotel, yeah. this hotel cheap hotel we found and uh wow. and that was about it in salem so i hope they've added more oh they, yeah they've definitely uh the hotel business is booming in salem i mean the tourist numbers have just gone up every year uh for the last at least six or so years that i've been living here every year the numbers are up and up yeah. and up so now there's the hotel imagine. salem there's the waterfront hotel which fun tip is uh, required to have a public bathroom accessible to anyone who needs it in their charter. So if you're in Salem and you need to go waterfront hotel cannot turn <laughs> you away. <laughs> Many places will try. You try to go to a restaurant or something. They, they guard their bathrooms jealously. Yeah, but, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks yeah. for the insight and the tips on Salem, Massachusetts. I know <laughs> listeners probably have an interest. <laughs> um, you in your bio here you call yourself a sacred artist mm-hmm. what is that i've that, not had that one yet oh yeah so that's a term popularized by my teacher uh, brianna saucy um mm-hmm. and uh i really like it both because i think it's a great catch-all for the for you know divination magic mediumship all the sort of the the, the sacred arts the magical arts um and i also like it because i am a visual artist and so for me, it's a really nice umbrella. I've always lamented that I feel the English language is lacking a little bit in terms for what, for what we do. Um, or, you know, it has a plethora of terms, but they have uh, sort of some connotations maybe or particular meanings that, um, that maybe don't always match what, what we would like uh, them to in the popular mindset. No, I got you. Yeah. Um, so Brianna Saucy, uh, what is it like, like training with Brianna? I've only read Brianna's book. I think it's, uh, making magic. Yes. Yeah. And I love that book by the way. Um, mm-hmm. I have not had a chance to talk to Brianna. Uh, what's it like training with her? How, how I what's the, what's the method? Love it. I just love it. She's as a person and personality, just a delightful, upbeat person, um, she's trained in classics, so she's very eloquent and intelligent, but uh, communicates in a very, you know, clear to understand, you know, she's really good at communicating is what I'm trying to say. You I know? Like it. Um, so I love that. A lot of her teaching is text heavy. She provides you with a lot of PDF texts that she's put together, as well as audio things like um, 
you know, what she would call active imaginations, a la Carl Jung, uh, sort of like a guided meditation, I guess, in a way, uh, but the idea that you are actively entering the other world uh, mm-hmm. and, and using the faculty of your imagination to access that world, uh, however your imagination works, whether it's visual or auditory or kind of knowing, whatever your style is. So I think that's really nice that it works for people with a lot of different kind of internal inner world mechanisms. You know, I feel so many of them are focused on a visual component. Uh, and, and I find it really, really accessible, um, for a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And she also does these like year long sort of trainings within the larger context of, uh, the sacred arts Academy, she calls it. And it's uh, now a four year training with each one year trainings, um, which I love. Mm-hmm. Love some juicy long-term working. <laughs> it's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. We like mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, in in your site, you talk about, you have this section called My Work. And you're talking about after almost 10 years as a spiritual consultant, you developed your own framework for using those sacred arts mm-hmm. to help people. And then you describe having seven aspects that are your framework. First one is face your gifts. What do you mean by face your gift? Like that's yeah, that's something I find a lot of people these days um, aren't spending the sort of time with themselves and their inner world that I think would be healthy for most of us to be doing. And by your gifts, I think I really mean yourself. Uh, what are you, you know, what do you do? What's your call? What are the things that you need to do? Like whether it's writing or dancing or carving candles under the moon, you know, whatever your jam is, what, where's your area of, of sort of, of joy and play, if that makes sense. Oh, I dig it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it joy matters to me. In fact, yeah. my tattoo, the runes that I have on there are, I don't know how well you can see them or Ooh, not. But, yeah. Um, the first one is Wunyo for a reason. That's joy. Joy mm-hmm. is first. Ansu's is the second one. That's wisdom. So we have joy first, then wisdom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. Amen. That's exactly why I start with this kind of almost pl- I want to say almost playful language of gifts, this connotation of childhood, something good you're receiving. There's, there's, there's like something to play with here. Mm -hmm. This, this hint that we're going to play, like this is work. And sometimes it like tears you open and a lot of people cry, but it's the kind of good cry, you know, like Joni Mitchell (laughs) says, laughing and crying. It's this release. (laughs) Uh, So, but I find it really important that we start with this idea of you are, you have joy. And you are joy. And there's this something of value in you and of you that comes through you, you know, and we want to tap into that. We want to acknowledge that. And we really want to start there, start mm-hmm. off on that solid foot of joy. I like that. Joy first. Mm-hmm. I dig it. Totally. Joy, then I wisdom. Mean, I love it. One thousand percent joy. Then you go on. I, I mean, we, I'm not going to make you go through all these seven steps of your framework or anything. Um, but I would like people to know more about what you're doing because I think it'd be wonderful if they'd come work with you. Uh, you'd go on and say that you can help people through different things here. And the very first thing you say is ancestral trauma. Mm-hmm. That's a big, scary phrase that mm-hmm. might be confusing too. So what do you mean when you say ancestral trauma? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. Um, a lot of that stuff ends up being mediumship work where mm-hmm. first thing is you have ancestors who are traumatized, who were traumatized. And that trauma, it's, I mean, science has shown it, it is passed down in the DNA And Mm -hmm. so I think to heal a lot of our own wounds, we need to start with the wounds of our ancestors, both the wounds they inflicted and the wounds they, you know, uh, received. Um, So as a medium, that's where I like to to do a lot of our our biggest kind of work. Uh, I don't want to say juicy, but this, this, yeah, this really meaty, (laughs) just deep, deep. That's good for deep work. No juicy ancestors. (laughs) Oh, daddy, juicy ancestors. Come on. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, there's room for all thing. ancestors. Come yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I guess then that feeds into because you go on to say emotional blockages, feeling stuck, mm-hmm. troubled dreams. That probably all ties in together, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's all really like like people in bad bad places. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you get into talking about um, having a holistic approach to all this. So when you're talking about having a holistic approach, what do you? What do you bring into the table that that is that's all part of your sacred art artist practice? I'm sure, but yeah. you know, what are the key components thereof of the holistic practice? Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is is the land again. This idea that okay, every where we feel so separated, we feel so alone in our pain, but we are part of this bigger world. We're not alone. And I truly do believe that everything is connected and that there is a string you can find to pull, to bring you forward, to bring you where you want to bring, to bring you out of what feels like a tangle or some, an entrapment, a trap. Uh, And I really, truly believe that. I believe that you're, it's never too late. You're never too lost uh, to find that thread to pull. You're not? You don't think anybody's ever too late and too lost? No. <laughs> Exceptions prove the rule, right? Yeah, nah, I'm, I'm yeah, nah. That string. No, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have questions about your mediumship mm-hmm. that aren't forming themselves very well in my head. <laughs> um, so we're going to dig into some other stuff and see what happens. I want to talk about tarot because you yeah. and I love tarot. Well, yeah. you, you list tarot on here. I assume you still love tarot. Oh yes. <laughs> um, first of all, what's your, like, what's your go-to tarot decks these days? What do you use? Ooh, I've been <laughs> using uh, a couple favorites in rotation. Um, the I cosmic tarot. Rotation. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Same. <laughs> oh yeah. Let's see. So there's always, there's my first love is always going to be the Wildwood Tarot. Uh, wow. It was the first deck I ever bought myself. Uh, I just love as a watercolor artist. I'm such a sucker for the art. I'm such a sucker for the beautiful Celtic imagery. I just, it's, it's my all time classic fave. So when I feel like I'm personally really in need of guidance, I always go to the Wildwood. Nice. Love it. Um, I've also been reading with a, um, a copy of the cosmic tarot that a good friend gave me. And Mm -hmm. that is really special to me because, um, it was the deck used by my best friend's late mother, who was really a mother figure to me when we were growing up and who sadly passed away, uh, when we were still teenagers. And, uh, so I never got to really read with her and talk to her about tarot, but having this deck makes me feel connected to her in a way that I'm really grateful for. And now reading with the same deck she did, plus it's got amazing 80s imagery, the big hair, the mustaches, like I love it. <laughs> and I also appreciate it as a deck for has that has some, uh, that's not all nice imagery, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it when it goes a little hardcore and it's like, yeah, sometimes everything's on fire and that's okay. <laughs> sometimes everything's on fire it's okay to not be okay folks yeah you just gotta you gotta admit it though you can't do yeah. fire till you admit hey you know everything's on fire yeah you gotta start <laughs> there i'm something. on fire <laughs> everything's on fire now we can move forward yeah. and deal with it i love it <laughs> Not for the folks on fire. We don't like it. We don't like that for you. I hope you're better. Um, yeah. 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 Um, can I be honest though? In my mind lately is a tarot deck that I've been working on. Um, yeah. That I've been working on for the last 10 years. 10 years. You're not done yet? I'm not done yet. Uh, I'm hand painting yeah. everything by watercolor. 78 uh, cards. 78 cards. Maybe one or two extras depending how we go. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a Star Trek tarot deck. Star Trek. Star Trek. Star Trek. And uh, I've been so honestly lately I've been I've been digging into the tarot books a lot as well as sticking with my mainstream my 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 hardcore my heart like tarot decks, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Um, going back to my Rachel Pollock, uh, my holistic tarot, 
all that kind of good stuff. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time in the studio painting <laughs> cards and thinking about the Seven of Swords and, oh, uh, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seven of Swords came up. Why? Why, why Seven of Swords? What happened? Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> Seven of Swords came up uh, because the way I've been making the de- the deck is I'll just be watching Star Trek and I'll see a moment and be like, there, that's the Seven of Swords. There it is. It's Fizbin. There we go. <laughs> Captain Kirk playing Fizbin. There we are. And so I'll, I'll just be, I've been making them completely out of order. Just as soon as one appears to me out of uh, a Star Trek episode or a thought or, yeah. Now. Have you got a Kickstarter or anything going for that? Not yet. I've got a a publishing proposal that I'll be sending out um, to try to get it a home. And if that doesn't work, yeah, we'll we'll Kickstarter it up. Okay, cool. Please do let me know when you do. I will. We'll get the word out as much as I can. Yeah. Um, When you you shop for a tarot deck or look for a new tarot deck or anything, Mm -hmm. um, are there certain cards... do you look for that you have to see before Ooh. all the other make the difference? Honestly, no. There's no, no card I have to see. There are cards I like to see, like death. I need to see. I, I guess maybe I need to see the death card. Um, yeah. But I tend to shop. I don't want to say on vibes, but <laughs> here's. <laughs> Here's how I bought my first deck was I was in a shop. I was shopping around, you know, with some where else. Uh, and they had a tarot section across the room. And this like shaft of winter sunlight came through the window and struck the front of this box. And it was like a movie and everything slowed down. And we ran to each other across the room in slow motion. All the music played. And it was just like, I just knew. I was like, that one. That we, one. we are going to be friends. I guess it's kind of like people where sometimes you meet someone and you're like, oh, we're going to be friends. We're going to get along really well. But sometimes you got to like spend a a couple of times spending time with someone before you know you're like, okay, actually, this is a really good relationship we're building here. And I've had some tarot decks like that where I've seen somebody else read with them or I've had readings with them um, and been like, actually, I'm I'm into this. I know where we're at. I'd like I want this deck. Um, so that's always fun, but honestly, it, it is kind of vibes. It's vibes. It is. Yeah. It's what, fun. what makes a good death card? Uh, hmm. <laughs> How's it get to be deathy enough? <laughs> How does it get to be deathy enough? Well, my favorite imagery is um, the scythe. I, I like to have a scythe. I'm a little traditional in my scythe, and it's, but not all the decks I love have a scythe. I mean, in um, in the Wildwood Tarot, it's uh, a raven tearing, you know, the meat and flesh off the skull of an elk or something. Uh, mm. So I do, I kind of need it to be dark. I need yeah. it to be the death card. I don't want, I, I need it to not sugarcoat things. If the deck is going to really sugarcoat things and pulls punches with the death card, I just, I don't know. Not that I need the death card to be uh, something real, <laughs> something bad, but I right. need it to acknowledge that like change is hard. Change hurts hard. and it involves losing some things and you're gaining other things and your life is going on and it's natural, organic change, but it's still change and that's hard. It's fucking no, I hard. It. Yeah, no, you are absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Uh, say, I, I always wonder that with people who read tarot, because for me, I, I have to see certain cards, mm-hmm. you know, the high priestess and the star have to resonate with me on some level. Mm-hmm. Like they have to. Uh, the two of swords has to. I Interesting. fucking love that card when it's done right. And mm. it has to have like this look at it and get a crossroads kind of energy to it. Right? Ooh, yes. And uh, the nine of pentacles for me. Mm. If I don't see or feel like the goddess Freya is winking back at me through that card, <laughs> I don't want the deck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love that yeah because you're so right you're so right yeah oh, i'm gonna get a recording of that i'll make it a ringtone <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. my phone ringing you're so right you're so <laughs> right you're so right <laughs> <laughs> um people out there that want to get into tarot uh what would you recommend that they do do they need to follow a beam of light to a box in the store <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> you know your mileage may vary. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I have a couple favorite recommendations. Um, one is to keep a journal uh, in whatever form that works for you. I use a traditional you know, written journal, but if you like to do audio recordings or if you like to video yourself or, you know, whatever works for you, keeping some kind of log of your ideally daily card pulls to get to know the deck, to learn the cards, whether you like to do it like chronologically or whether you like to just randomly pull cards, you know, shuffle and pull every day. That's what I recommend for beginners who want to learn is get to know it, journal it, write it down and to write down or record your own first impressions of the card before you look it up. Yeah. Before you go to the book. Really? Cause the, and then you, then you can go to the book after you're done and write down what that says. And then you get to look at them and see, okay, where do they match? Where do they not? What's similar? What's, what am I picking up on? What's specific to my situation that this book doesn't speak to at all? Cause it can't. Yeah. Uh, so that's my best advice. And then if you want someone to learn from, I would go to my, my girl, Teresa Reed, who is one of my other teachers and mentors and just a fantastic yeah. human being. Shout and, out Teresa Reed, who mm-hmm. has been on the show too. Woo-hoo. <laughs> yes. yes. Her this books, awesome. her blog. She's amazing. She'll teach you everything you need to know. Hell yeah. Yeah. Teresa <laughs> was an episode that, as, as awesome as Teresa is, Teresa does a lot of astrology. You talk about astrology. You do astrology. Yes. Um, I don't. I just don't compute. I don't connect. It's just, <laughs> it's not my thing. And yeah. I, I have thought long and hard, like, how do I start this conversation with someone who's, I want to talk to you about astrology when my brain's just like, I don't. I don't understand it's just I don't, like grief. and I don't want to understand and <laughs> I had to make it interesting to myself somehow and then we had a fantastic conversation I mean, Teresa made me want to learn astrology after that oh. so that's the power <laughs> of history you say on here you utilize astrology. What do you, how do you apply astrology as a means to help someone else? What are you looking for there? Yeah. So I, I read birth charts. I also read charts for projects. Um, so if someone has a project they've started or want to start, I will absolutely re- love reading the chart for the project. And uh, I'm looking for just sort of telling the story. I feel like what I'm doing is I'm looking at, I'm just translating something. And often I, it has almost no, I don't want to say meaning to me, but I'll say things where I'm just, it feels like I'm reading hieroglyphs off a rock and the person I'm talking to will just start crying. And they'll be like, no one has ever said this to me. Like, how do you know that I feel this way? And you're like, I don't know. I just read what was on the page. I just, I don't know. I'm just describing to you what I see. Uh, and I, ironically, I got into astrology because I, like you, I did not understand it at all. Mm-hmm. And I grew very frustrated with this. And I was like, I want to understand what the f- you are talking about. What do you mean <laughs> Saturn is, is doing what in my, what house? Huh? <laughs> I need to speak this. I need to be able to read this secret language you guys are somehow speaking to each other mm-hmm. that makes no sense to me. Uh, and so it's more of, I feel like it's a supplemental part of my practice where a lot of people want to talk about it. And so it's nice to be able to fold that into a tarot reading. Um, to be able to talk about some parts of their birth chart. Sometimes I'll pull cards about things in the chart to help explain them or to help talk, you know, kind of reflect them back to the client, uh, which is always fun. Uh, I love mixing and matching my medium. And uh, yeah, I just, I sort of let the chart tell the story and let it take us where, where it it wants to go. Um, There's so much to talk about. So I either have to time the involvement of astrology or really just focus on a few, a few key things that I see that are like, okay, these are relevant to what we're talking about. I kind of go in sometimes with a purpose, like, okay, what do we want to know? What are we looking for? Are we looking for, you're having trouble with creativity and you don't know how to play? Like, let's, let's talk about it. Let's see what shows up here that speaks to that issue. If that makes sense. I like that. Um, and I have a hard time sticking on astrology. So we're going to talk about something else. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and full disclosure. Um, 
you have in here a thing it says you do dream interpretation Mm -hmm. um may i pick your brain about a a fucked up dream i had several months ago absolutely may (laughs) i love hearing about people's dreams for everyone to hear um so i have this dream (laughs) back up a minute i i do this whole ritual devoted to freya uh, Mm and for reasons and then I have this dream where I am on a sunken pirate ship underwater, Ooh. but breathing fine with other people Ooh. who I couldn't tell you who they were. We're ghost hunting. <laughs> and then we turn a corner into what would have been like, I don't know, a ballroom on a pirate ship. Wow. And there's a giraffe. <laughs> waiting Whoa. for me <laughs> in the sunken pirate ships ballroom while i'm ghost hunting <laughs> you're looking for ghosts you get a giraffe no one expects sunken ghost giraffe <laughs> sunken ghost giraffe oh my god a new what a... name i call it <laughs> i love it <laughs> so what do you wow. make of that with dream interpretation oh, damn. I mean, I... <laughs> so Wow. It led to some interesting events in my life that I cannot disclose Ooh, of course, on the of show because I do not want any pe- people like having problems or whatnot. But <laughs> it led to some very profoundly interesting events that all came from me sharing the details of that dream. But I'm still really unsure what is up with that dream in particular. Yeah. So when I've got a dream like that, that I really want to pull like the skin back on so to speak. Um, I use a method that Brianna Saucy taught me, uh, which is essentially a Mad Libs-ification of the dream, where you write it all down, and then Mm -hmm. you pull out and make a list of all the nouns. And then next to each noun, you write, wow, what is that? What is like the symbolic definition for me? What does that mean, you know, to me? Uh, A sunken pirate ship, is that adventure? Is that, you know, is that, what what, what are the associations kind of? What, what, What is that to me? symbolically uh, and then you plug it back in and every single time you do this you get something you never would have kind of predicted i find it really interesting when it all comes together because you kind of know individually like oh, i want to dream about my dad you know this and that but to yeah. plug it into the context of the dream and to see it written out that way is just like a slap in the face with a fish it it's really <laughs> insightful and not that it's necessarily like a, okay this is 100 percent exactly what the dream means definitely this is your subconscious's message but i think it can really help uncover some some deeper le- levels and layers of the stuff going on there deeper levels can maybe be insightful. i like that yeah I, I may give that a try to review back on it because mm-hmm. there's a lot of unresolved things that came out of that <laughs> <laughs> And I have continued to have, still to this very day, dreams where that giraffe, that giraffe, appears usually outside a bookstore in a street, big pane window. Mm. And I'm with with someone. It's always that same person in this dream. I know who that is now. And they know it too. And the giraffe is always in the street just chilling like looking at looking at us through the window like what do you want (laughs) (laughs) like i don't know what you want (laughs) giraffe come on ghost giraffe what do you want sunken ghost giraffe (laughs) (laughs) what do you want (laughs) why are you in the street yeah see weird dreams are like they're fun folks oh, they're so fun <laughs> but and that's what made me wonder because you know you remember there used to be all those books the big thick books too mm-hmm. that would be like dreams signs and interpretation mm-hmm. like flip yeah. it open to giraffe and it'd be like uh whatever definition they give you and that's yeah. what all giraffes and all dreams are yeah supposed to be. no no, no. No, I don't. Uh, no, I don't use dream books <laughs> at all. Yeah. That's what somebody else's dream about giraffe would mean. Maybe I want. I'm, I need to start a special series on here called the Sunken Ghost Giraffe Series, where I just have people tell me their weirdest fucking dreams. Oh, yes, I listen to that every night before I go to bed. 
<laughs> that sounds like a good idea. I'll have That's to remember a that. Great idea. Yeah. Oh, and if yeah. y'all want to steal it, fine. But you can't use sunken ghost giraffe. <laughs> Dibs. It's mine. It won't have the same ring if it's That's right. sunken ghost giraffe. So. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see here there's another part in here that i love you said a magical life is one that practices right relationship with ourselves our bodies our communities our allies and our land mm-hmm. that phrase right relationship like as a heathen very animistic leaning mm-hmm. heathen that lot to me and i know what it means to me what does that mean to you right relationship with all these different things wow what a good question um it i think for me it is a feeling in my body is how i Mm -hmm. recognize it is a sense of almost of clicking of like i i it's a feeling i definitely get when i'm grounding centering and anchoring the sense mm-hmm. of I am part of a much larger world that I do as an animist believe is alive. And I am one part of that. I'm my own valid little valuable part of that. But I am just one little part of this incredibly mind-bogglingly big universe, multiverse, you know, multidimensional mm-hmm. existence. And understanding that and recognizing it and celebrating it to me feels like right relationship celebrating and honoring it and i think so much of the pain that people are experiencing today is due to this sense of isolation and separateness from that this you know in the united states we live in a very individualist culture that really values the individual and emphasizes separateness you know what's mine is mine you can't have it uh and I think that does a dis- uh, that that can wound the psyche if you're not careful and you're not actively cultivating that sense of right relationship. And I'm here, I belong, I'm part of something bigger, and I want to give back to it because it gives so much to me. I'm literally alive. Mm-hmm. I'm alive. I'm eating food every day. That is a gift being given to me by the world I'm in. Not that I don't have to do anything to get it, of course, but there's this, you know, I'm not just laying on the conveyor belt being fed canapes by the universe but yeah it's it's for me that a big part of right relationship is the act of giving offerings why else am i burning incense why else am i you know bringing bundles of herb to the the beach over by my house like there's a i get that feeling in my body of right relationship Uh, you Mm -hmm. know why do i spend all this time you know, uh, connecting with the land and sending, you know, all the good stuff I can out into it. That's the right relationship sense that lives in the body. I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. Um, In there, in that little thing too, you talk about right relationship with our allies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now I stand at my altar every day and part of my daily practice is, you know, giving offerings to, and I say, my allies, those mm-hmm. who help aid, guide, and protect me. Mm-hmm. And I give them the offering. I say, may it arise, take the form of all space, the form of desire, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. And then I say, may peace always be between us in that. Who are you talking about when you say our allies? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my um i i also stand here at my altar which uh, just off camera every day um <laughs> and for me and especially as a medium there are some very specific allies i'm talking to every day and um, one of the big ones is uh santa muerte holy death as a medium i mean catching that's, a theme here folks that's my <laughs> girl <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a death card that's real deathy. And you described your favorite one; it was like tearing the skin off. And then, <laughs> what about dream interpretation? You're like, oh, I really like to tear the skin off of it. And <laughs> ally number one, Santa Muerte. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, working with Santa Muerte, what's that like? Like, how do you? 
it's intense Why that relationship i gotta tell you it's um it's really intense but i feel like it's a it's a, a holy helper an ally relationship that i've been sort of moving towards all my life i feel like all of my life i have had this affinity with death I'm very interested in it it's been something i've always felt strongly drawn to uh is death the spirit world and when i first encountered her it was when I was living in San Francisco, which has a very strong presence of devotees to her, you know, entire shops devoted to her. And so she came into my life as a very tangible presence and sort of made herself known to me in a way. Uh, and working with her now is, I want, you know, it, it feels like, um, like the witch you want to live deliciously this is mm-hmm. my, this is living deliciously to me. This is when I wish people could see you because look, she's <laughs> kind of dancing and swaying while she says that, you know? <laughs> I, I like it. She makes me feel that way. I feel so happy working with her. I feel very at home in her crypt chapel. And I feel very strongly that this is my most important work is my death work. Uh, mm-hmm. I do people mediumship and I do pet mediumship and pets, um, pets as well. Yeah. And uh, I like to bring the dancing joy of Santa Muerte to people mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of people obviously are afraid of, of death and uh, the dead sometimes. And um, I like to bring that dancing to them and be like, it's okay. not so bad. It's so okay. Santa Muerte is a specific named ally. Uh, who else you got in the, in the bag? Are we exactly. talking about saints and big spirits like this or are they other types? There are definitely other types. Um, there are the ancestors of blood and spirit. So, you know, the obviously the ancestors of blood, self-explanatory, but the ancestors of spirit being people who have lived before me, who I feel are aligned with some lineage that I am in not of blood, you know, all the, I have several, um, artists and painters. I'm a painter, uh, Mm -hmm. in my, my lineage of spirit. Um, people who taught me who are no longer with us are part of this lineage, obviously. Uh, and, um, that is one of the, the keystones of my, my ally, uh, uh, altar here is the ancestors of spirit. Um, especially as a queer person and someone who, who, it has been working on healing my, my blood lineage for a long time. The ancestors of spirit feel to me like, like coming again, like coming home, like you're taking off your suit and tie and you're like, I can relax here. Like, these are my people. These are my people. I like it. Yeah. Say so when I say my allies in my offering like that, and then I call on them in ritual, I'm not thinking of anything named necessarily. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure they're all human. You know, just well, I strongly yeah. agree. I know mine are not all human. I definitely yeah. and those are the those are the, some of the specific named ones. But you're right when I when I when I'm giving my my offerings in that way, I am including. I know the land is included as an ally. I know that there are many animal relatives that are included in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot, and I know there are maybe non-human spirit type beings involved in that i i do share this sense that i don't necessarily know all of your names and faces or that you even have a face um but you're my allies and you're welcome i do i like the broadness of that table setting of like my allies whether i know your names or not whether you have a face or not thank you Mm -hmm. thank you for aiding guiding and protecting me i like that and Mm -hmm. um you may not remember this i have the notebook around here somewhere amongst all my notes but Soon after I interviewed you in episode one, I hired you for a tarot reading. And, and, um, cause I like to do that once in a while as a professional tarot reader. I think it's important to go oh, to others. Yeah. Strong agreeing. Yeah. Once, you know, once in a mm-hmm. while, cause we can, it's kind of like recalibrating yourself, yeah. like getting out of your own way. Cause we <laughs> yeah. get into our own little wishful thinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when we're doing it for ourselves. I don't care how hard you try not to. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And um, you were, I mean, I'd always had this concept of making offerings to different types of spirits and stuff. That's been a long 
part of my practice. But this concept of allies, I first got the idea of them coming and going as they were needed mm. from you in that tarot reading. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it further developed, you know, with Aiden Walker's work and yes. stuff. Yes. It become what it is now, which is a much more developed form mm. of how I conceive of all that. But you were the first person that put this notion in my head that rather than just making offerings to these different classes of spirits that I have this mm -hmm. group of like specific allies mm -hmm. unique to me. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And I started exploring that more after that tarot reading you gave me. So that's so cool. Um, consider this a five-star rating. If you work with Paige getting a reading or something like I, I highly from personal experience do recommend you all try. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Um, before we wrap this up, <laughs> I was looking at your website for different ideas we might get into and talk about, you know, and you have a section called, um, things I've done. And I like, I like that. That's cool. Hmm. And then there's one thing on here called heavy leather topless dance party. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? Is that it is listed? It's listed after you know. Um, I was on this podcast and we do psychic self defense, and I do these kinds of readings. And oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was on the heavy leather topple stance party, I was a, a guest. Is <laughs> it is uh, a local access television program out of Somerville, Massachusetts. <laughs> Uh, it is such a good time. Uh, a very good friend of mine was a singer in their house band. Uh, and they just invited me to come on for one episode for an interview. And, um, I had the most fun with the host, Ken. They have, you know, they have burlesque dancers. They have a cramps cover band. They're just like this. I love the energy that you can have in like a local production like that that is yes. so unhinged and so much fun <laughs> i love it unhinged and it was it's one of my favorite uh, interviews i've ever done um <laughs> and you just can't beat that name <laughs> oh, no you can't <laughs> i'm like that is fucking great <laughs> and then it goes back into you know astrology charts astrology <laughs> Illustrated a big book and <laughs> to keep people on their toes, you know. Yeah, <laughs> make sure you're still reading. <laughs> All right, Paige. Um, this is the part where I usually wrap up the regular portion of the show. Uh, is there anything that um, that I didn't bring up, or you'd like to talk about? You know, now would be a hmm. great time to throw that in, or just any parting thoughts you might have. I guess there's one thing we didn't go into too much that's on theme, which is the pet mediumship. Yes. So this is yes. A newer, it's a newer part of my work. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's definitely a newer part of the work. Um, and it is my, my new favorite. Um, I've whole life had a very strong affinity with animals and it's something that started just organically coming to me. I didn't sit and be like, oh, I'm going to do pet mediumship. People started asking me like, you know, this, this regular old mediumship reading was great, but like, do you talk about animals ever? Because I have this, you know, dog, this cat that passed away that I really need to talk to somebody about. And these readings are so powerful they are so they're they're not too terribly involved honestly a lot mm -hmm. of it is just having someone to share that sacred space with because i've what i've found is a lot of people say that they have this animal companion this like spiritual animal companion that lived with them that passes away and they find people in their lives are like basically get over it like what's the big deal it was just right. a cat it was just a you know a dog it was just a whatever and they kind of have this this grief to process that they don't really know what to do with. And that's their family. They, yeah, they are, exactly. They, they are, are it's a family they are member. Family as anything else in family. Absolutely. You know? like, yeah. yeah. And, and it's a unique relationship you have with them because you are their caretaker one hundred percent of the time. And so uh, how do you experience that? Because we were talking about mm -hmm. how you you know experience the dead earlier. Yeah. But with a pet, like mm -hmm. I, I, 
must confess, I can't wrap my head around this necessarily yeah. how you get like pro- productive communication yeah. out of this scenario. How's that work? In that case, it was something I went into really interested to see what would happen. Uh-huh. Um, and what I found is it was really heavy on the I show you method where, mm-hmm. you know, these, they're not talking to me with English. They didn't suddenly learn English uh, <laughs> on the other side, but they can like, show you. never fill my water. No. never <laughs> fill my water bottle. And <laughs> <laughs> so there is this definite energetic sense of the presence of kind of like almost a personality in a little way. But a lot of it is, you know, like with people show me, you know, well, what's going on here? Show me how you're feeling. I will say with animals, it's almost never a case of they need to be resolved. Um, animals are pretty good. They don't tend to stick around the way people do. Um, so mm. it's mostly about the living person, actually, in this case. It's mostly about the living person who, who in most cases, you know, they had to put the pet down uh, or, or something, something happened. Sometimes, you know, God forbid, something tragic happens. Um, and they need to know, you know, did I make the right choice, mm. uh, at the end of this animal's life? Did I, did I do good? Basically, did I take care of you? Okay. Did I do a good job? You know, because you can't speak to them. You can't ask for their consent when it's time for euthanasia in the way you right. can with a, you know, with a person that you have that kind of care relationship with. Um, and so there's this, this sense of, of guilt that a lot of people carry, and that's mostly the focus of the session, honestly, is them sharing, them getting this sense of like, yeah, you did right. And I have yet to have an animal be like, actually, you messed up, like, real yeah. bad. It's the animals are like, no, you, because in every time it's someone who genuinely did what was best for the animal, um, no matter how much it hurt them personally. Uh, and, you know, whatever harms or slights there were, the animal always forgives. Mm-hmm. And it's this very cathartic session for the client in that way. Nice. Um, and I just, I find them really rewarding for all yeah. of us to be doing. We'll have to be present with you physically. Do you do? No, I do them virtually. Okay. Yeah, I definitely, like all my readings, I do them virtually. I love, I love a good virtual reading because you can get your nice recording and. Um, good. Yeah. Good. I like that. Um, you know, it, for like pet mediumship, I, I don't think I something I would pursue. But I have had one of the coolest experiences uh, with a dog spirit Mm. of some kind. Uh, When I moved into this apartment, Mm. it was because, you know, my ex and I, we had split up. A 15-year relationship had come to an end. And we did so peacefully. We get along. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. We just realized that our journey together had come to a close. Mm -hmm. And grew up and became adults and admitted that to each other. (laughs) 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 And... um, when I first moved in here for the, I can't have pets here for one. Mm. That's the rule of the building. I hate it. And my, my youngest daughter, you know, still a minor, uh, the only one of my children that's still a minor. Um, she's bummed about it too. She wants a cat yeah. <laughs> and we're working on it. We'll, yeah. we'll see what we can do. But um, for the first, I'd say four months of living here, when I would go to bed, and get in bed, pull the blanket up, get cuddled in, you know, nice and comfortable. Mm-hmm. I would feel the unmistakable feeling of a dog jumping in bed and laying down, nestled in between, like behind my legs. Wow. Un- I've had dogs my whole life. I know yeah. what that feels like. Yeah. For the first four months, every night I went to bed, I got that. Oh, and wow. ironically, it's about the time that this all started to feel like home. That I stopped having that visit. Huh. I thought that was so fucking cool. And nice. I don't know which dog it was. Yeah. Uh, I I knew it was one of mine. I'm not mm-hmm. sure which one, because like I said, I've had dogs all my life. Mm-hmm. So I've had the unfortunate reality of losing dogs yeah. all my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? They, they yeah. got the shitty end of the deal on years. Yeah, uh, I did. So I don't know. That's my only experience with um, my undeniable, I had no question about it, experience with some sort of animal in spirit form familiar to me. You know, like, couldn't argue it. (laughs) 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 No rationalizing that away. I mean, the whole, like, 
shift in there. Anyone who has dogs knows what I'm talking about. Exactly what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard a lot yeah, of stories that's... like that. Cool. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So hey, I talk thought about that was allies. Cool. Talk about allies. They like right? to, they like to watch talk out about for allies. Us. When you yes, need it, do. when you need it, I'm not going to bug you every night forever, but that's right. When you need it. <laughs> Are you good now? All right. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be playing in doggy heaven and doggy, whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I always thought that was so fucking cool. Wow. Um, so cool. Well, thank you so much for being here again. I'm glad the plan finally came together. Me Episode too. 100. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> uh, and um, please tell everybody where they can find you. Yes, uh, you can find me at my website, pagezafariu.com. And you can spell my last name because it has all the vowels in order. A-E-I-O-U-Z-A-F-E-R-I-O-U. <laughs> dot com and you can find me uh on instagram at page the fair you on uh twitter at tarot and t and uh, a couple other little places scattered around i think um those are the main places right now okay and i'll make sure that all that's in the show notes too i've i've always remembered that about your name it's like all the vowels <laughs> are in order <laughs> it's the godsend that helps all of us continue to spell it <laughs> right <laughs> all its greek glory <laughs> <laughs> nice all right um for everybody listening thank you as always for listening like i said if you want to hear where Paige used to be go back and listen to episode one uh page helped launch this show and that that is something that i will forever say much love and gratitude to you thank you so much I'm so honored and um if you like what you hear, please share it. Share it with your friends, your family. Tell everybody to come check it out. Share it everywhere you can. Spread the word, please. I, it really helps. Um, if you want to hear the rest of this conversation, we're going to go to Patreon. And I didn't start Patreon until about episode 10 or 11. So Paige has never done this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and if you want to hear how that's going to go and join in the fun, you're going to go have to go to weirdwebradio.com, click join the membership, or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio. As always, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Stay weird out there, my friends. And now it is bonus audio time. Paige Severio, are you ready? I'm ready. Paige <laughs> is ready. All right. First question is always the same. What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit and why? So I've done a couple of these pilgrimages already in my life. Yeah? Yeah. I, uh, when I was very young, I went to uh, Oxford to visit Tolkien, J.R.R. Oh. Tolkien, and um, his old buddy C.S. Lewis, some of my youthful literary favorites. Um, I have some... You know where I think I'd like to go? Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions and magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership. You can find me on Instagram at weirdwebradio. You can find me on Facebook as Weird Web Radio or come join the new fun and exciting Weird Web Radio Facebook group. Thank you again for being here. Stay weird out there, my friends. Thank you.